This evening, I will be taking the services. The service I'll be continuing in Genesis. On Monday, we have the Bible study, and in the evening, we'll have the catechism class. Want to leave Tuesday free uh, for visiting people. On Tuesday evening, we've got the Road to Recovery, 7.30 p.m. We have a prayer meeting, which will be taken by myself, God willing, on Wednesday. Uh, the drop-in began last Friday, and we had a very good response, actually. So we were delighted, and uh, we hope to continue in the same way. And it was lovely to see and Marie from the council community, community council worker coming in with her colleague. We hadn't seen Anne Marie since before the lockdown, so that was a marvelous, marvelous uh, uh, development of things. We'd spoken about a lot. And next Lord's Day, I will be in Dowenvale taking the communion. I'm still trying to get a preacher organized for next Lord's Day for us here, but I'll be taking the communion service in Dowenvale. And I would like to just give an advance notice that our communion will be the following week at Lennox Town. So all these things uh, by God's grace, God willing. And with that, um, We'll begin our public worship of God by singing to his praise in Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Lord thee, my God, I'll early seek, my soul doth thirst for thee, my flesh longs in a dry parched land, wherein no waters be. We'll sing this to God's praise, and we'll sing verses uh, one, I think it is to seven, is it Angus? Mm -hmm. My God,
Let's pray together. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning in the precious name of your own precious and beloved Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we do pray that you would come and help us, that, Lord, you would help us by giving us, Lord, your Holy Spirit to lead us. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us your Spirit, and we now do depend upon him, Lord, that we might be led into your truth, that you might be honored and glorified in our midst and in our hearts this morning. We do thank you and praise you that you are Lord over all. You are our creator, our redeemer. You are the God who upholds us and sustains us. You are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom to know is life eternal. We do praise you and thank you this morning, Lord, for the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, the only hope for a lost and dying world. We pray this morning, Lord, that we would be led into your truth, Lord, that we would be led to see Jesus, that we would be led in every aspect of our service, Lord, this morning. Our Father, we thank you for your promise through your Son, Jesus Christ, that where there are two or three gathered together in my name, there am I in their midst. And we thank you for that, Lord, that we can rest in the truth of your word, and the fact, Lord, of your unchanging nature and character. We bless you and thank you that you are God with us, God in us and God for us. And this morning, Lord, we do confess our sins. We confess, Lord, that we're not what we should be. We're conscious of falling short and failing you in so many ways, and yet, Lord, we thank you that with you there is forgiveness, and that, Lord, in Jesus Christ, we are standing in the wonderful grace of God, forgiven, justified, adopted into your family as your own beloved children, loved with the same love that you have for Jesus, your only begotten Son, because we are accepted in the Beloved. Lord, these things are a marvel to us. We can only uh, lift up our hearts in worship as we contemplate and meditate, Lord, upon your grace and glory. And this morning, Lord, we do thank you for your many blessings to us. We thank you, Father, for the fact that you've gathered us here. We thank you for the folks on Zoom. And Lord, we're conscious that there are many who are unable to be with us because of circumstances, illness, and indeed, Lord, the, the, the terrible uh, distress of seeing loved ones so ill, Lord. We pray this morning for Nan, Father, that you would be very close to her and that you, Lord, would reveal yourself to her heart, to her mind. Lord, we know that you are the God who is able to speak to us whatever our awareness or level of consciousness is. And we pray this morning, Lord, that your deep consolation would be shown to Nan and that you would give her, Lord, all that is needed at this time. And we do pray this for Eric, Diane, and Neil and Ross, 
and Haley and Caroline, Caroline and Colin, and uh, the children, Lord, Malachi and Mirren, we know, Lord, this is a very painful and difficult time for them. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would be glorified in Eric and Diane's witness to the family and to the, the staff at the NHS. And we thank you for the staff, Lord. And we pray that you would continue to bless and uphold and sustain the doctors, nurses, and everyone, Lord, who has been uh, so wonderfully uh, taking care of us through the pandemic. And we give you the praise, Lord, and the glory for that. We remember Katrina, Lord, who is isolated. And we thank you for her, and we pray you would keep her safe, Lord. And our Father, we think of uh, uh, Shan and Mike and the children, Lord, the girls. We pray that you would continue to sustain and uphold them, Lord, and deliver them. And the Father, they would all soon, Lord, be able to be out and about. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would work with those who are struggling with COVID this morning and be a blessing to them, Lord. Father, we do think of the, the situation in our own nation, Lord, as we emerge from the COVID uh, pandemic, that again, Lord, we would take nothing for granted, but continue in humble dependence to look to you, Lord, and that you would order things aright, Lord, because you alone do all things well. We thank you for your grace and mercy to us, Lord. And Lord, we thank you today that we are in a country where despite our failures and the failures of those who lead us, Lord, that we live in a democracy where we have freedom, Lord, to speak and to worship you without the fear of persecution. And Lord, we do pray for uh, the nation of Ukraine. We remember the Christians and the civilians there, Lord, that you would be around them as a wall of fire to guard them and to protect them and shield them, Lord, as we see the barbarity that's happening, happening around in the cities and townships, Lord. Father, we pray that you would surround the Ukraine with your holy angels to protect men and women and boys and girls. And we do pray for the protection of the government, the armed services. And we do pray this for the Russian people, the Russian forces, Lord, who have been sent in on the orders of a dictator, Lord. We do pray, Father, that in this you would bring an end to the hostilities, Lord, and that, Father, you would not allow uh, the oppression of a people, Lord, who are aligning themselves with a democracy and with the rest of the world. Dear Lord, we ask that you would rise up and let your enemies be scattered, Lord. We do pray, Father, for the conversion of souls in this crisis, Lord, as many fear for their lives, that they would also fear for their souls, Lord. They would call upon you in the day of trouble and that you would show them great and mighty things which they know not that you would reveal Christ to them. And Father, we pray that the United Nations would act swiftly and uh, would uh, really deal, Lord, with the, the fact that a dictator was chairing, a dictatorship was chairing the United Nations while the rule of law was being violated on a declaration of war. Lord, the absurdity of these things is a sign of the times we live in. We pray, Father, that you would establish righteousness and that you would have mercy, Lord, 
on all. We do pray, Father, for our community, our congregation, Lord, that your name would be glorified in the salvation of souls and many coming to worship with us and with the people of God in this community and to the ends of the earth. We do pray, Father, for uh, the work of the gospel, that it would advance, Lord, to the ends of the earth, and that you would protect your people, Lord. Restrain evil, we pray. We are mindful, Lord, of Ian and Colin and Susan, that you would be with them, Lord, to bring about healing and a measure of uh, restoration in their condition and situations, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for them. And we thank you for answered prayers, Lord. We remember Will and Kath, Lord, and just uh, we are so grateful, Lord, for the work you have done with my brother Will and the way he has come from the very edge, Lord. And gracious God, we do pray that today you'd be with Donalda, who's been so unwell, Lord, and th there's so many issues, Lord, that are conflicting and the treatments are, are helping one thing, but making another thing worse, Lord. Please, Father, help us. And living God, we pray today that you would be glorified in our worship together, Lord, that our hearts would be filled with your spirit, that I would rightly divide the word of truth, Lord, and that when we go one from the other, Lord, that we could truly acknowledge from our hearts that it was good for us to have been together this morning. We do remember, Lord, all that are known to us who are unwell, who are struggling, who are uh, struggling with addictions, depression, anxiety, Lord, be with them where they are and provide for them, we pray, Lord, according to the, your tender mercies, Lord. And we pray these things, Lord, with the forgiveness of all our sins, in Jesus' precious name, and for his sake, Lord. Amen. Well, we're going to sing our first hymn now, which is that beautiful hymn, There is Our Redeemer. Own son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One.
please turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts and at chapter one, and we'll read some verses from verse one. Acts chapter one and at verse one. Let's hear from the word of God. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his sufferings by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Amen. And we pray the Lord would truly bless that reading of his own precious and holy word. And to his own name be honor, praise, and glory. We'll Continue worshipping God by singing to his praise once again in Psalm 67 from the Scottish Psalter. Lord, bless and pity us. Shine on us with thy face that the earth may know and nations, that the earth thy way and nations all may know thy saving grace. Sing this to God's praise.
my mic off. Sorry. People, were they hitting me? Okay, well, I can begin again. <laughs> I think we should. <laughs> Apologies to everybody online. I never put my mic on. We were mentioning that what the church needs today, Ian Bowne said, is not better machinery, better methods or movements or organizations, but rather men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer. And I would say that we could add to that women, boys and girls. And Charles Spurgeon tells us that without the Spirit of God, um, we can do nothing. And we know that the Lord has said that to us. We are as ships without the wind, branches without sap, and like coals without fire. We are useless. How we need God's Spirit. And today, we're going to look at verse 8. And verse 8 is really a summary of the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit's plan to reach out to the whole world. And if every church would realize the power we have been given, we could reach our own families, communities, our nation, and further afield. And God's kingdom would be advancing, which in fact it is. And in chapters 1 to 7, we can see in the book of Acts, the gospel is shared in Jerusalem. In chapters 8 to 19, the gospel is shared in Judea and Samaria. And in chapters 19 to 28, the gospel is shared further afield and is still being shared to the ends of the earth. And I want to look at the promise of Christ before his ascension, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And that promise, of course, is accompanied with a purpose and a power and a presence. As you look at verse 8, you will see that it's connected to verse 6 and 7. And the disciples asked Jesus, was he going to restore the kingdom? And it wasn't a question of chronology, because Jesus told them that the Father, it was not for them to know the times and seasons that the Father had set by his own authority. It's the timing of the kingdom is in God's hands. But what Christ is concerned about here is the work of the Spirit. And it's the task of the church, you and I, or the church, to bring a lost world to bring Christ to a lost world, and to bring a lost world to Christ. But we know 
that it is only the Holy Spirit that can do that. This is to be done through the public proclamation of the gospel and by personal witness. And when, when I say personal witness, that covers a vast variety of ways and means. Now, Christ gives a promise here, and it's regarding the ability to serve and the assignment in serving. And the first thing is the empowering in the promise. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You see, when God calls, he enables. The church is power. It's not of its own. It's not of human origin. It's not of a human institution. Jesus said, you will receive power. And the word, the verb will receive is in a tense that suggests it will occur in the future. Jesus was saying the church will receive power. The power is a gift of God. A gift is something we receive. A gift cannot be earned. It cannot be bought. Salvation is a gift. Salvation is what we receive. We can't earn the Holy Spirit. We can't buy the Holy Spirit. Remember Simon Magus. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of hands, Simon the sorcerer, he offered them money saying, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And that, that's in Acts chapter 8 verses 18 to 19. And the word receive, lambano, means to take hold of, to obtain possession of something, or to accept something, or benefit from something. In the word receive, Jesus was speaking of something, not only that the church would receive, but something that the church would take hold of, because you have to take hold of a gift. It carries the meaning of something being offered and what is being offered being accepted. Jesus is saying that the church would receive power. The source of the empowering, like we said, this power is a gift of God. And this Holy Spirit, it is when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they will receive the power. The coming of the Holy Spirit and the enduing with power were one and the same. The power does not come first. The power comes with the Spirit. Like we said, it's not man's power. It's not man's personality. It's not man's persuasiveness. It's not man's or woman's charisma or charm or winsomeness, but divine power. And of course, the Holy Spirit can use all of these things. And the Holy Spirit can use all aspects of a person. But the important thing to know is that without the Holy Spirit, there is no power. The power is God's alone. The Holy Spirit reveals the power and the wisdom of God in the person and the work of Christ. You know, Jesus spoke about being born again. And in the next breath, I always find it wonderful. But in the next breath, he spoke about being lifted up on the cross. He said, you must be born again. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And then he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. That is, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then he goes on to speak the wonderful verse of John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life.
And you see the connection between the Holy Spirit and the receiving of Christ. And of course, it's Christ that has purchased us the gift of the Holy Spirit through his own precious blood, the laying down of his life, the taking back up of it again, and Christ crucified, risen, exalted, is the power and the wisdom of God. So the source of the power is God. The strength in the empowering, well, there's power in it. There's power in the blood, isn't there? And that blood has bought us the Holy Spirit. It is not our own strength. There's power in the blood of Jesus. It takes strength, power, and ability to serve Christ. We cannot do it in our own strength. We haven't got the power. We haven't got the ability. We can't be Christians in our own strength any more than we can give birth to ourselves. Neither can we give ourselves spiritual life. We can't give ourselves spiritual power. We are born again by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And when we are spiritually reborn, the Holy Spirit will give us, <coughs> excuse me, that power. <clears throat> we need to live the Christian life, and it is divine power, the best power, the greatest power. And that does not mean that we are supermen or superwomen. It means that even in our weakness, God's strength is magnified. Because we're told in 2 Corinthians 13, 4, talking about Jesus Christ, for he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. You see, in our weakness, the power of God, the strength of God. The grace of God is made perfect. Now, the word power is dynamis, and it's used in reference to the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we get dynamite or dynamo, dynamo generates electricity, doesn't it? That's where we get the word dynamo from, from dynamis. And it's used in reference to the power of the Holy Spirit. It speaks of the miraculous ability, miraculous capability or strength to perform an activity. It speaks of a power that is part of the nature of the possessor. And the power is inherent in God himself. And this means that the church has supernatural power available to her at all times because the Holy Spirit indwells the church. The Holy Spirit is always ready and willing to empower the church for her work, the work that she has been called to and commissioned to by the Lord. The church has been given the power of the Holy Spirit to make her able to meet the commission of being a witness collectively and being witnesses individually. Like we said, now we have methods and training and that is good. And uh, we should not knock them by any means, but they cannot win the loss. The power of the Holy Spirit is the one thing the church cannot do without and still be effective in the work of God. This means that being a witness is not easy, but it is a wonderful and beautiful privilege, a blessed privilege. When the church receives the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit will be experienced when we in humble faith depend on the word, the will, and the spirit of God. So there's the empowering in the promise, 
and there is the evangelism in the promise. You will be my witnesses. Now, not everybody's called to be an evangelist, but we are all called to be witnesses. And evangelism means an evangelist is the bearer of good news. And as witnesses, we can all exemplify that good news in our lives. Now, it's important to realize this. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in, Ju uh, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, first, Christ the Lord describes their service in the promise. The persons for evangelistic witness, you. That refers, first of all, to the first disciples, but it also refers to you and I, to all of God's people. You will be my witnesses. Second, the proclamation, the person, you will be my witness. We will be witnesses to Christ witnesses of Christ and witnesses for Christ. And the word will receive is in the future tense. And it, it speaks of a thing that is certain. It suggests something that will occur in the future. The verb will be speaks of something, listen to this, that you will become not something you will do, it's something you will become. And that was what Jesus said to the early church. And that is what he says to us. As we have received the Holy Spirit, it's not something we will do. We have become his witnesses. You will become my witnesses. Do you see? We are already his witnesses. We have become his witnesses by virtue of our salvation, the death and the resurrection of Christ, and a receiving of salvation and the Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit makes you and I, made the early disciples, what they had not been and what we have not been before. The things that we do as a church will be the result of what you and I have become. What have we become? Witnesses. That's what we have become. Whose witnesses? Witnesses to Christ, for Christ, and of Christ. And witnesses, that speaks of a price as well. The power of the Spirit was going to make the church Christ witnesses. That witness in Jerusalem, then Judea, Samaria. Now, in Jerusalem first, and that reminds us that our first witness is in our own home and community. And Samaria was the mixed, uh, a mixed uh, race. They were Jewish and assimilated with other foreign races. And Samaria would be a kind of stepping stone leading into the rest of the world beyond Israel. And lastly, this witness was to go to the ends of the earth. And that, friends, is the stage we are at. We are in our own families, our own communities, our own nation. And yes, we are also to the ends of the earth. Now, witness, what is a witness? First of all, a witness is someone who testifies that something is true. I know this is true. In a court of law, if a witness is called, that witness will testify. Now, uh, who was it? Uh, I forgot his name. That's terrible. But uh, he was a, a lawyer who... Uh, investigated the claims of Christ, and he said, uh, Lee Strobel, and he said that if it was taken to a court of law, based on the evidence, the court would have to decide that Christ rose from the dead. And friends, that's what we are witnesses. Now, hearsay is not accepted as evidence. Witnesses must give an account of their own personal experience. What you and I know. A witness cannot testify, well, maybe, or, you know, who knows, possibly. 
Witness will say, I know. I know who Maya believed, and I am persuaded, Paul said, that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. What kind of witness was Paul? A witness is someone who simply tells what he or she has seen and heard. Peter and John said, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Acts 4.20. A witness simply tells what they have seen and heard. That's, that's what we do. It's the Holy Spirit who works in people. All we do is testify. It's the Holy Spirit who, who pleads and who testifies with the spirit of those we witness to and calls them to give the verdict. Friends, and it's very true, of course, that the Holy Spirit does use people. It is the words given by the Holy Spirit that makes the difference. And absolutely, preeminently, and supremely, the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God, the Bible. That is why we must love the Lord and His Word. And that's why we must be acquainted with the Lord and his word. Because what the Bible says, God says. You know, speaking about the word of God, we read its own testimony. The, the Lord says, the spirit said, it says. You know, all these refer to God himself. The Bible is God breathed, it tells us. It's sometimes translated uh, the, uh, that it's uh, inspired by God. But the true translation is God breathed, theopneustos, and it means the breath of God or the spirit of God. The word of God is from the spirit of God. And that is how we test the spirits, because this Holy Spirit in a person will not contradict the testimony of Christ in a person. Second, the witness is not only by our words, but of course, by our lives. And how often we fall flat with our words and our lives. May God give us help and strength to be honoring to him, that our lives would be attractive to others, and that our words would be with grace, seasoned with salt, because what a very attractive and compelling thing, the silent witness of a changed life, live for Jesus is. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful witness. The third thing, the word for witness is uh, mart martyrus or martyrus, and it's from where we get our English word martyr. That's what martyrus means. Martyr means a witness. Jesus is the true and faithful witness. He was faithful even unto death on a cross. And it suggests, like we said, there's a cost, there's a price for witnessing. And there is a price in a, in a general sense, there is a price sometimes for witnessing, where you might experience hostility or mocking or social isolation and things like that. But for some, it costs them their lives. A witness for Christ. Most of the disciples were martyred because of they were faithful witnesses for Christ. They died for Christ. And a witness for Christ often became a witness unto death, a martyr. To be a witness means to be loyal, whatever the cost. We don't know what we would do under any given set of circumstances. We don't but we would pray that God would give us the strength by his spirit to do what was right. A martyr is one who suffers death for the sake of a cause, and a martyr for Christ is one who has died, not simply for a cause, but for the truth. We know as Christians that know that the power of our witness is affected by our speech and our lifestyle.
And the Holy Spirit was given to make us strong and effective in our speech and in our living. And that includes being salt as well as light. You know, salt adds flavor and seasoning. And salt is sometimes irritating. But we should always remember as well that we need to be not to put salt on tender wounds. We need to put balm on them. So there's such a thing in that sense as too much salt. We need to be salt and light, but we need to remember that Jesus was full of grace and truth. And what a difficult balance that is at times for us. And we are to commit ourselves by the power of the word and spirit to be in the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Because do you know what Jesus said? That is who we are. That is who we become. And here we have the plan, pattern, and places for witnessing for Christ. Ultimately, world evangelism. Begin in Jerusalem, begin with family and friends, neighbors, and then on to the rest of the country and the rest of the world. And we read this before the giving of the Spirit. One of the two in John 1, 40, 42, one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Kephas, which means people, uh, Peter. Now, the Holy Spirit wasn't given to them internally, but the Holy Spirit was with them. The Holy Spirit was simply given in a different way before Pentecost and before Christ's resurrection. What a great lesson for us. Andrew first found his own brother and pointed him to the Messiah. When the Holy Spirit will come, the next place and people they were to reach out to is Judea. They were to witness to their own culture and country. They were to be witnesses for Jesus to those who were their countrymen, who had the same cultural background the same understanding of scripture. This would be a, a strong learning curve. They would have to learn to follow the Holy Spirit's lead and live out their Christian lives in a very hostile environment amongst the Jews, meeting strangers. They would have to get used to moving on and to adjusting to new situations. Now, the United Kingdom, of course, has a wonderful Christian heritage. And it was a wonderful missionary country. But now we have missionaries coming to us. So reaching our family, friends, and our own nation are of paramount importance right now. That we might raise up people to go into all the earth. How could we be serious about reaching someone else's country if we're not serious about reaching our own family and friends? Saul and Barnabas were, <clears throat> became foreign missionaries. <clears throat> and the example is they were powerful witnesses, evangelizing, evangelizing where they already were. The next place and people they were to go to was Samaria. They were to reach out beyond the boundaries of their own country and be witnessing, witnesses evangelizing the neighboring country. Who is my neighbor? Uh, one of the lawyer, teachers of the law asked Jesus, hoping to trick him. And Jesus gave the parable of the good Samaritan, who the Jews hated. And the Samaritans weren't too fond of the Jews. It represented a foreign culture. They were most familiar with it. 
because it was the one closest to them. Now we can look at Russia and Ukraine, how similar they are in culture and how devastating it is to see man's inhumanity to man. The Samaritans were of mixed race. They were descended from the Jews that had been assimilated with other peoples. Now, after the Assyrian captivity, the Assyrian government sent foreigners into the land to merge, who would merge with the remaining Jews. They developed their own religion and various other idols and based on the Torah and their own form of worship. The Jews were not of a mixed race and they had a radical and severe racial and religious prejudice against the Samaritans. The Holy Spirit had to send Philip, who was a deacon, and it was not until the revival broke out in Samaria that the apostles were in any way willing to go there. And finally, they were to evangelize, be witnesses to the ends of the earth. Now, when we talk about evangelism, we are talking about personal witnessing, public, public proclamation, and all the means that God puts at our disposal. Paul said that he became all things to all men. And that means to use the gifts we are given in whatever way that we can, according to the Spirit. And they were to reach out to the regions beyond. And especially, of course, in the proclamation of the word, go therefore and teach all nations from the, to the ends of the earth from the north to the south, to the east and the west, to be made, to be witnesses needs power. We can't manufacture that power. We can't get a generator manufacturing it. We need to receive it from the endless source of renewable power. We're renewed every day by God's spirit. We might be we might be uh, outwardly diminishing, but inwardly we're increasing in power as we look to Christ. Power from God, the Holy Spirit. We are to be witnesses, friends, then. As we receive the power, we are to put our hands out, uh, so to speak, and receive it. We are to open our hearts to receive it in faith. Witnesses to our fam families, friends, communities, cultures, countries, and to the ends of the earth. An evangelist is one who brings good news. We have the glorious news of Jesus Christ. And we are all witnesses. We can all say, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, was blind, but now I see. Once was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. But friends, this work, of the Holy Spirit is not yet finished. We have become witnesses and we are to continue being the witnesses that God has called us to be. So may the Lord bless his word, the promise of the Holy Spirit, and we're talking, including the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and the evangelism through the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll sing our last, uh, well, we'll pray and then we'll sing our last hymn. Our gracious God, we thank you for who you are and what you became, Lord. You took on flesh that we might become children of God, that we might have the spirit of adoption that cries out, Abba, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross, your death and resurrection and your exaltation. Lord, our God, we pray that you would continue to empower us, to enable us, to continue to be what you have made us, Lord, your witnesses. In Jesus' name, Lord, we ask it and for his sake. Amen. Sing our last hymn, which is Amazing Grace. We are always mindful that salvation 
is always a work of grace and that our witness is always through the spirit a work of grace. Now we do pray for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit to rest upon us and to remain upon us and all whom we love now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you, Christine, Margaret, Angus. <laughs>